Hey guys, welcome to my channel, Lynn Chess TV. So, I've been meaning to do this video series for a long time, and this video series is intending to create an uh, opening repertoire for black against e4. So guys, this video series will include a lot of materials that I personally prepared for with many Russian grandmasters when I played the age group tournaments at the international levels at under 14, under 16, under 18 and it was after that point that I had to focus on my university, university studies and thus I had to quit chess seriously and now that I no longer play chess professionally anymore I don't mind revealing all the secrets that I prepared during those days and I'm going to reveal each and every material that I prepared with these grandmasters so you're going to be you can be completely confident that the quality of these materials are going to be very high and I'm going to cover each concept in depth so you don't have to worry about missing out on anything so you can completely trust me on this guys so in this video series as I mentioned we're gonna be creating an opening repertoire for black and that is against the e4 variation so you can do that by playing the accelerated dragon the accelerated dragon is a variation of the Sicilian defense against first move e4 so we're gonna be concentrating on the main lines of the accelerated dragon and we'll cover the sidelines as well so you don't have to worry about missing out on anything as I said before but what you should be doing is watch the videos in sequence so that you don't miss out on the previous one and end up getting confused while watching a later part of the video so guys in this video I'm going to be giving you an introduction on why accelerated dragon should be played over the classical dragon or the traditional dragon variation I'm going to be giving you a small introduction about that and I'm, 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 I'm also going to introduce you guys to a small variation in the Accelerator Dragon called the La Flare variation. So the Accelerator Dragon goes like this. This is the standard moves of the Sicilian defense. You're going to play in C6. After D4, C takes D4, Knight takes D4 and you play G6. Guys, this is the standard setup of the Accelerated Dragon. You play g6 here and it's the Accelerated Dragon. White can continue with many moves here. He could play c4, which is the Meroxy bind. He could play knight c3. He could play bishop e3. He could play bishop e2. He could also play... I think these are the main, line guy, main lines, guys. So... I'm going to be covering each and every line in depth and this video series is going to have at least I'm not sure how many tutorials it's going to have but it's going to be covered in depth that's for sure it's going to have at least 10 tutorials or probably more than 10 and each sub variation as well will be covered in depth and you could be completely confident playing this against a player of any level in a tournament in real life or even online so this is gonna work against probably anyone so you can trust the quality guys you can you can even cross check this by setting up the same positions on the board I highly recommend you do that because try these positions play these positions with white give the same position to your friends ask them to play black and you could just test out the position from here Guys, in the Accelerator Dragon, we played G6. So I'm just going to compare with the normal Dragon variation. In the normal Dragon variation, the, it goes like this. You play D6. D4, C takes D4, N takes D4, N F6, N C3. And here we play G6. So the difference between Accelerator Dragon and the normal Dragon variation is that the pawn was still on d7 in the accelerator dragon the pawn was still on d7 and our intention in the accelerator dragon always 
you got to remember this the key point in accelerated dragon is to get the pawn to d5 because in the dragon variation you should normally see that it goes like this after bishop e3 bishop g7 if white played bishop e2 he could he usually continues with bishop c4 or f3 but let's just consider a normal variation bishop e2 or something like that what black's gonna do is play bishop d7 knight c6 and eventually he's gonna get the rook this rook or the this rook after castling get the rook to c8 sacrifice this knight and take control over the center if the pawn is already defended then black's gonna sacrifice the rook on c3 and play d5 later so this is the standard uh, idea of the uh, normal dragon variation but in the accelerated dragon what we have is the possibility of playing d5 directly so we're not gonna waste we're not gonna waste a move playing d6 and then d5 this is not necessary at all so if d5 was to be achieved if d5 is the ultimate uh, goal of playing the dragon variation then why not just keep the pawn on d7 and get get to d5 whenever there's an opportunity so you should realize that uh, as, I, as I'm saying this in my variations I'm going to demonstrate to you how d5 could be played almost every time and if ever black um, if ever white does not give you an opportunity to play d5 then you can see that black is almost always getting a better position so guys so if that's the reason we hold back d7 the d7 pawn and play d5 later so i think you must have understood the concept on why we are choosing accelerated dragon or the dragon variation guys my intention in these videos is to help you understand on how openings are played instead of just giving you the moves because I don't want you to buy heart the variations you can't memorize every variation in chess instead you got to develop this intuition of thinking in particular positions so I'm trying to create this kind of thinking patterns that you have to understand while playing this opening on initially on why accelerator dragon is chosen instead of the dragon variation and i think i've given enough introduction because as i talked about it's always a d5 square the d5 square so we're going to challenge the center if we were to challenge the center by giving away the rook uh the cat the rook which was castled or bringing bringing this rook and then sacrificing the knight on c3 and thus playing d5 if that was to be done it's a standard sacrifice guys in the dragon variation so if if a sacrifice is to be done just to play d5 then i think uh, i'm going to show you a slightly better variation not that dragon is bad but dragon is highly refuted at the higher levels you should have probably known this if you're an advanced player watching this video if you're already a player who is above 1900 or 2000 elo rating then you probably know that dragon variation is refuted at uh, 2700 plus levels most people are not playing dragon variation so it, it is because white has solid variations like the like this one where they can play nc3 and you play g6 they play bishop e3 bg7 they play this bc4 variation and the attack on the queen side castle on the queen castle on the queen side attack on the king side and even though there is a lot of depth in these variations uh, it's not uh, there's a lot of theory to learn trust me and it's probably not even worth it so we're gonna learn the accelerator dragon as I said this is the standard setup this is the initial setup of the accelerator dragon variation guys you play g6 in order to create this fianchetto of the bishop on g7 you're bringing this bishop to g7 and creating the same pressure that you are going to create in the dragon variation it's the same pressure that you're going to create while trying to take the control of this diagonal the same pressure and you're trying to intend the same thing you're intending the same thing you're trying to play d5 so 
you're gonna see how the moves go and in this video as I said guys this is just an introduction on why you should play the accelerated dragon and why it is chosen over the normal dragon variation and let's head to the first variation guys so the first variation that I want to talk about is La Flair variation in this variation um, white is gonna play in c3 and after bishop g7 we are gonna play bishop g7 create some pressure on the center as this knight is in a good position so black either has to defend this knight somehow because it's attacked by two pieces and there's just one defender from the queen either white has to defend this uh, knight by playing bishop e3 or probably something else bishop e3 looks optimal it's a main variation and we're going to consider that in the future videos or he could move this knight to a place like in b3 which is the Lafleur variation Lafleur variation you may not see it a lot but the concepts are going to be very clear after I explain this so if black played knight b3 to dissolve the tension in the center then guys the normal variation to um, like normally people might play d6 this is the standard way to continue even the engine even the engine would suggest you to do so but the move that i'll be suggesting right now is gonna give you a lot of tempo playing black it's slightly an unusual move but trust me guys as i said uh, in the starting initial point of the video itself these are preparations that I made, made for the at the international levels for the international levels and these are the preparations that I have uh, done with many Russian grandmasters so the opening lines are pretty solid and I'm gonna explain you each move I'm gonna explain you why each move is played so that you get the clear understanding of why every move is played in the accelerated dragon instead of just seeing the theory as it is so after nb3 we're gonna play bishop takes c3 check yes i understand that this bishop is quite strong in the accelerated dragon or in the dragon variations but whenever the opportunity comes we're gonna play bishop takes c3 if required but we don't normally do that always but if given an opportunity then we're gonna take it Bishop takes c3, pawn takes c3. We are not, we are not able to play d5 directly. You can see that there are two attackers, so we play in nf6. So tell me, guys, how is White gonna defend this pawn? How is White gonna defend this pawn? Either he has to play f3, which doesn't look like a good move at all, because I can directly play d5. He takes d5, Knight takes d5. The pawn is attacked. If Bishop d2. Then I can play e5 with queen h4 check. There's a lot to be done and in f4 as well. There's a possibility of in f4 as well. You could play in f4, not queen h4. You could play in f4 and thus bishop f5. Play queen b6 as well. Like bishop d3. If white played bishop d3 here, you can play castle, castle. Queen b6 check, king h1, you can even take this bishop on e3. As you can see, we are we don't have our bishop on g7. So what we should try to do is get this bishop somehow. Because this bishop can get very strong if the bishop came here, created some problems, even though it's not gonna happen suddenly. We don't want to allow the bishop to even get a chance. So we're gonna just play in e3. Bishop takes e3, queen takes e3. These positions, these pawns are isolated, as you can see. And the pawn structure is quite uh, pathetic, to be honest. So, you can just play bishop e6, bring the rook to d8. And black is, a, black is in a good position, guys. We are on the 14th move, and you can see that black is already in a very good position. So, I don't think your opponents are going to play f3. So what they would try to do is play bishop d3. It's just a way of developing this bishop and also defending the pawn on e4. Guys, the intention of playing bishop takes c3 was to play d5. Was 
a chance to get to play d5 in the subsequent move. Here we play d5. After e takes d5, queen takes d5, the spawn is attacked now. So white has to castle and after castling, the standard way to continue here would be castling as well. This is what probably your engines are going to suggest or probably what would seem natural to you. But what I will be showing you now is my own preparation uh, with uh, these grandmasters. As I said guys, I don't have anything to hide now nowadays because my professional chess career is almost over and I just play chess to have fun. Now I'm just trying to teach chess in real as well. So I'm just taking this opportunity and this platform to share my knowledge with you guys and I hope I really hope this is going to be helpful for you and I hope this is uh, going to be popular as well because I'm trying to create uh, videos having a lot of depth this is these videos are going to have a lot of depth so the move that is to be continued here is bishop f5 so after bishop f5 I'm going to be showing you the best moves for white to play most probably your opponents may not play these moves but I'm just considering the best engine moves the engine suggested moves the engine is suggesting c4 so this was an analysis that I did a long time back c4 you play queen d7 so you can see that if bishop takes f5 you can just play g takes f5 or you could even capture the queen on d1 and after rook takes d1, now you can play g takes f5. So what you can what, what, what you can see from this position is that even though these pawns are isolated, even though both the pawns are doubled and we have a double pawn as well, we have these pawns together, whereas these pawns are isolated. And these pawns are going to cause a major problem in the end games. You can play rook c8. Even though you may not directly get those pawns, uh, white is going to defend those pawns but you can create a lot of pressure and white is going to have an awkward position and i don't want to be playing white in this position because it's going to be problematic in four to five moves from now so this variation looks good for black guys so i don't think white is going to exchange the bishop and allow you for exchanging the queens if he's gonna do that then be happy swapping the queens and getting into a good position he's probably gonna attack this queen and try to make what uh, try to make the best use of his double pawns because it looks quite shabby at c2 and c3 so if he played c4 then you can play queen d7 and the best move for white here is to continue with knight c5. As I said guys, I'm just I'm just focusing on the best moves that white can play. It's not just random moves. These are the best moves that white can play. Most probably your opponents may not continue with these moves, but well let's for the sake of the analysis, let's focus only on the best moves so that we are equipped for any kind of situations. So after nc5, we can play queen c8. Now what what white can try to do is play bishop h6, bishop h6 to hinder our castling ability. And what we would not what we can do here is play knight g4. Guys, we are on the thirteenth move, and the analysis still goes on. So you can see the depth of this analysis. That I'm presenting right now and white is gonna play bishop g7 to ruin our castling chances and this is not a problem at all we don't have to worry about it after bishop g7 normally you would continue with rook g8 but as I said guys even in the opening I talked about gaining a tempo of playing d5 instead of d6 and d5 instead of wasting a move playing d6 and d5 in the same way we are going to play queen c7. You can see that this knight is attacking the pawn on h2. And this queen is in a good square to attack this pawn on h2. So why not play queen c7. 
does threatening a checkmate so most probably your opponent is not gonna play h3 I can guarantee you that because if your opponent has played accurately till here then you can expect good moves from him as well because if h3 it's just a queen h2 checkmate so your opponent might not play h3 because uh, it does not seem natural to play this accurately till here and play h3 in the next move but you, you don't know what could happen if we play h3 then just be happy that's it so he's most probably gonna play g3 g3 and now you can play rook g8 attack this bishop drive the bishop away he can play bishop c3 or bishop c2 bishop b2 but the best move is to continue with bishop c3 because bishop c3 is not gonna hinder this file when white plays rook a b1 you will probably understand this in uh, probably a couple of moves when I show the variation after rook g8 white is gonna play bishop c3 and we play triple zero and white plays rook b1 so this is the reason why bishop white could white would play bishop to c3 and not b2 because if the bishop was on b2 then it would be obstructing this rook attacking the spawn on b7 this this bishop would have been an obstruction to this rook attacking the pawn on b7 so that's the reason bishop c3 is a better move if he play bishop c2 then it's gonna be easier for black it doesn't matter i mean if he's gonna play bishop b2 you continue with triple zero the idea is to get this knight to e5 and take control of this diagonal you can see this guys this diagonal is vulnerable it starts from here but either you can get the queen to c6 and this attack this diagonal and also you can see that this bishop and the queen are on the same file as the rook so there's a lot of pressure created on this file so you can take advantage of this file as well so if he's gonna continue with bishop c3 then you're gonna play triple zero if rook b1 uh, the most natural way to continue the engine might suggest knight c5 but it's not a natural move to play knight c5 because you're gonna be giving the spawn white can capture this and it's only equal trust me guys it's only equal and you don't get an advantage here but instead what you could do is play b6 which is natural as well as you're defending the pawn on b7 and moving the pawn to b6 and after knight a6 which is the best move for white if he played in b3 we're gonna play knight c5 this pawn is attacked this bishop and the queen is coming here and he's not gonna move this bishop as well trust me because yeah you see it so nb3 doesn't cause any problems for you and it looks like a passive move but he's gonna play in a6 and you can play queen b7 and if he plays c5 if he plays in b4 then you play in c5 and black is clearly better threatening a check and a lot of problems are gonna be cast it's probably a two more checkmate if he plays terribly three more checkmate if he plays terribly but it most certainly will win you some material and it will lead you to a winning position so he's not gonna play in b4 if he played in b4 then it's of no threat to you he most probably will play c5 but even if you played c5 we play with in c5 if he captured we would capture and a check and you know that the queen is on the same diagonal as this so if he moved his king to here or here then it's on the same diagonal as the queen and you don't know what could happen next i mean you can if if it was to be avoided by playing like this if white got scared of the nf3 check and avoided it by playing f4 then we are just going to capture this bishop and when he captures back this way 
You shouldn't forget that this knight is hanging. Queen takes a6. And we are clearly clearly winning here. We are material up. If c takes b6, pawn takes b6. If he played something like rook c1 check. It, it looks threatening but trust me guys it's nothing. You can play king b8. If he played d4 now or probably rook c3 now. You could just play rook takes d3. Try to exchange the pieces. And you're clear, clearly winning this. Yeah, I don't see a way how you're gonna lose this unless you miss a big time. So I think we have analyzed the flare variation clearly, guys. I think you've got the understanding of how the accelerated dragon works and what the intentions are behind playing the accelerated dragon. So I just explained to you uh, one variation of the accelerated dragon guys. It's just one variation. There's a lot to be covered I could have covered these concepts very superficially uh, Not going into depth, but that was not my intention. That is not my intention. I want to reveal Every secret of this opening theory on YouTube I'm gonna create a big video series on the accelerated dragon and I want to ensure that every uh, every viewer is gonna understand what accelerated dragon is about and how he could implement this in his games so after so just recapping the same guys if after nb3 as i said there are two options he could play bishop e3 which seems very logical we're gonna we're gonna see this in the subsequent videos but if he played in nb3 which is leading to the Lafleur variation i suggested you bishop take c3 check even though, as I said, it is natural to continue with d6, which might be the ancient suggestion. My suggestion here, with the preparation of many grandmasters, uh, it's bishop takes c3 check. After b, b takes c3, we don't directly get to play d5. d5, excuse me. We don't directly get to play d5. Because there are two attackers. So we're going to play an f6. And after bishop d3, we saw f3 as well we saw f3 as well and we saw that it wasn't of much use and we got into a better position almost immediately so after bishop d3 we're gonna play d5 e takes d5 queen takes d5 castle and i suggested i suggested a variation that is not castling but bishop f5 and and taking the opportunity to castle on the queen side, on the queen side, create a lot of pressure on this file. Not only create pressure on this file, you bring the, you create more pressure by being, bringing this knight to the center as well. Attacking this, playing h5, h5, h4, h3, if you get an opportunity. And we analyzed almost every possible variation in the Luffler uh, sub variation guys trust me on this I've covered almost everything so in the next video we're gonna cover the classical system which is gonna involve the bishop e3 variation and like this video I'm gonna cover the bishop e3 variation in depth as well the bishop e initially I'm gonna cover the bishop e3 and bishop e2 system and then the bishop e3 and bishop c4 system i'm gonna cover almost all the variations i'm gonna cover all the variations in the accelerator dragon guys you don't have to worry about the quality of the material or the depth of the analysis because these are variations that is going to the move 20. if it's going if the analysis is going up to move 20 then you can probably just assume that there's a lot of depth in this it's in some in some variations it's going to move 30 as well so these are openings that i've strategically created for myself and i'll be revealing to you in the subsequent videos so please follow my channel if you like this video please hit the thumbs up button and leave a comment down below if you want something in particular or you can have the silliest of doubts there is nothing to be don't be shy to ask about it because I will highly appreciate comments. I really need your comments because it gives me a lot of enthusiasm to make more videos. And also it will help me increase my frequency of uploading. So 
please uh, leave a comment down below and if you like this video and if you want to share it with your friends which you, you should highly do so then probably please share, share the video with them as well and don't forget to subscribe to this channel guys because I'm gonna be coming up with this video series and on this channel you'll not only find uh, about the accelerator dragon but I've made a video series about the Mora Gambit and I've covered end games, middle games, strategies, stat tactics so I've covered a lot of concepts uh, in particular on this video channel on this uh, channel so also one more thing guys I forgot to mention one more thing please uh, hit the bell button as well after you subscribe to my channel because YouTube has changed its policy of showing the uh, the people uh, the content that I upload because I don't know they have some uh, terms I don't know they made some policy changes so please hit the bell button as well for my uploads to appear on your updates so that's it guys uh, if you enjoyed this video uh, please continue watching the uh, video series and stay subscribed guys thank you for watching